Okay, so welcome back. This is, is this week three? What? Really? Did we do two weeks before I got sick or did we do a week after I got sick? One week, one week and we were sick. So we did a week, I was sick, and then we did a week? Is that what it was? That tells you kind of where I'm at. Okay, week four, golly. Um, you might turn the heater down just a smidgen, please. Um, so here's what we've done so far, kind of to, re, to redraw, to repaint where we've come from, right? Uh, today, in just a minute, we're going to tie up some loose ends. I want to go back. We're actually going to go back earlier in Matthew 24. We're going to pick up some of Matthew 24, make some comparisons to Luke, uh, which we did a little bit last time, if I recall. Uh, and then we're going to continue into Matthew 25. <clears throat> we're going to get all the way through Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 today. And that means that next week when we come back, we're actually going to jump into the Revelation next week. Uh, so, and that's going to be super fun because the Revelation is just filled with all sorts of wonderful pictorial examples of the end times. Uh, when we get into the Revelation, we'll be bouncing around a little bit to the Old Testament again, going back to Ezekiel, going into some of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah. We'll work our way all the way through the Revelation and we'll get to the day of the Lord and then we'll have a section, last time I taught the day of the Lord at the beginning of the Revelation, this time, so if you were here for the intensive, we actually did the, the day of the Lord right before we did the Revelation. I'm actually moving the day of the Lord to the end. I'm not going to cover the day of the Lord until the end because I think it's kind of the punctuation, the exclamation point. Um, we really can't understand and tie the end times together if we don't understand the day of the Lord. Uh, so just a spoiler, heads up, we're going to go that direction. Uh, we have a long ways to go to get there, but just be aware. So let's pray and let's invite the Lord to talk and uh, for me to listen. And let's just start, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, first of all, I declare that Jesus is Lord. I declare the Lordship of Jesus Christ over my house, over, <clears throat> over our businesses, over our family members, our parents, siblings, children, all of our possessions. Lord, I declare the Lordship of Jesus. Lord God, I just ask right now that you send angels to garrison about my house, that you defend us while we're learning, and that you'd open our hearts to be able to receive. Holy Spirit, we just declare that you are welcome in this place. Jesus said you're our teacher, and you remind us of everything that he said, so we ask you to do that. And uh, Father, I pray right now that you'd come and visit us here. Lord, we respect and honor you, and we thank you for the outpouring that you're, that you're ha that's happening, Lord, on our college campuses and around the world, Lord, as you're moving in people's hearts, Father. Lord, we just pray that you'd make us part of it. God, help us to <clears throat> help us to, to see you uh, the way that you want us to see you and the way that you want us to see you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that tonight. But as we leave, I pray that those things that we're learning tonight and the things that we're uh, convicted by, Lord, that you would revive our spirits, Lord, that you'd cause us to be men and women of faith, Lord. God, help us to operate in faith, to move in faith, to believe in faith, to prepare in faith, Lord. Let all that we do be in faith. So, Father, we just declare Jesus is Lord. We ask you to come and be with us, and we give this evening to you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. So, here we go. Matthew 24. Can right? I do an advertisement before we start? Um, sure. If everybody gets the chance to go see Jesus Revolution, do not miss it. You're Especially with everything going on with the campuses right now. Thank you. You you will come out, out so full. It isn't funny. Well, thank you. We uh, uh, we you you are only repeating what many of the people in the room here tonight have been saying. So you're you're probably the fifteenth person tonight to tell me go watch the movie. So thank you for everybody's looking and they're saying confirmation, confirmation. Okay, thank you for that, Diane. Thank you. All right, so let's jump into Matthew twenty four. Uh, and you heard what she said. She's seen it. She says it's good. If you haven't been to the movie, go check it out. Um, Matthew twenty four. Uh, if you recall the, the lineage that we went through in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Jesus begins in Matthew 24, 4. We begin with this conversation, Matthew 24, 3, actually, where the disciples uh, are asking Jesus. Jesus comes out and he says, you see all these things? Not one of these buildings is going to remain. 
and they're all going to be destroyed. And if you remember, I told you the works of Josephus. He's a historian. You can go to Josephus' seventh book, chapter 1, verse 1. You can read about the destruction of Israel. And in Jesus' response, his immediate response was, the disciples are asking, when will these things be, right? When, when is the temple complex going to be destroyed? What's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the age? And Jesus' response like, was like, like you saying, hey, I'm going to come to Bible study on Monday night or Saturday night and I can't wait to be there. And my response to you is bring eggs, right? And you have no idea why I said it. You just know that I said it. And I'm going to have to explain it to you to make it count, right? Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus is, the, the disciples are like, when are these things going to happen? When's the sign of your coming? When's the end of the age? And Jesus basically says, bring eggs, right? <clears throat> his response is, his response was not what they were expecting, I'm sure, because Jesus, the, four, the very first words out of his mouth were, make sure that you're not deceived. That's it, right? Jesus in Matthew 24, the very first thing that Jesus says is, be not deceived. Take heed that no one deceive you. The greatest concern that Jesus expressed when responding to the disciples' questions was, don't be deceived. So, I take that strongly. I take that as a strong response. To me, if Jesus, if the very first thing Jesus said about, when will these things be? When's the sign of your coming? When's the end of the age? And Jesus says, be not deceived. If that's what he said, that's the first thing that came out of his mouth. That's what we need to give the most. That's what we need to give the most, the most weight to, because he could have said anything. He could have answered them directly. He could have said, "Well, when you see the cloud split." He could have said, "When you see the armies come past around Israel he, or around Jerusalem." He could have said all sorts of things, but he didn't. He said, "Be not deceived." So I want to go back to that because that sets the tone for everything else that Jesus is talking about. He begins immediately going into there are wars and rumors of wars, plagues, plagues, pestilences, earthquakes, diverse places. These aren't the end. These are just the beginnings of sorrows, which we've which we discovered were the birth pangs, right? We talked about them being birth pangs. Um, Jesus says, nation will rise against kingdom, uh, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Family members will betray one another. You'll be put up to death. You'll be, just, you'll be killed for my sake. You'll be hated by the entire world. These are just the beginnings of sorrows, by the way. Sorry to, sorry to, to spoil your, your, your pr prospects on history, but when people start killing you, that's just the beginning. That's not even close to the end yet. And we've been seeing that all over the globe. We, I, I shared some experiences with you for ministry work that we do in Africa and what's happened recently there. Um, for thousands of years, people have been sacrificing their lives for the gospel. We live in a nation where... Our sacrifice comes by giving in. We don't lose our lives because we get beheaded. We lose our lives because we forfeit them. We choose not to follow Jesus. We choose to be lazy. We have so much freedom, we choose to focus on work. We, cho we choose to sacrifice our children to Moloch, right? They would sacrifice their children to Molech. What would they do? That If you're not familiar with that in the Old Testament, they would take their children, they would sacrifice them by putting them in the fire. They would actually burn them. And that would guarantee to them that they would end up with a great harvest. Here we don't do that. We just abort them. We want to sacrifice our children. We do it. We abort our children. Because it'll be better for me if I do it that way. I'm going to have a better crop. I'm going to have a better life. So it's no different. It's just the way that we kill our kids is different. And I'm just being honest. So when we look at this, what we see is we see these ways that, that for us, we face the same issues the rest of the world faces, but our battle is different. Because we have so much choice and freedom, we surrender our relationship with God versus something confronting us, trying to take it from us. The enemy ends up stealing our lives from us, and, and ultimately then we will pay the ultimate price because when we stand before the Lord— we give an account for our lives and our works aren't there, right? So Jesus, I think, in many ways, as we look at Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, Jesus is, I, I feel like he's kind of talking to the American church because when we see the parables that he's giving to us about 
the why about the the goodman, the steward, the five or the ten virgins, right? All of these things. It's like these are people that have position, they have freedom, they have they're already respected by the king or the person of leadership in all of these parables, right? And in every case, we have the good and the bad. So before we get back into those, we left off talking in Matthew 25. We talked about the ten virgins, uh, and we're going to go back there in just a minute. And I told you, spoiler alert, that we're going to talk about the word meat. Do you remember me telling you we're going to talk about the word apantasis tonight? Anybody remember that? So let me give you just a couple of things first, though. I want to point out a couple of things. I want to, I want to compare a couple of scriptures to help us fill in, because I believe that Scripture interprets Scripture, that there's enough in this book. We can drop this book in the middle of the Amazon, and if some little dude finds this book and he can read, there's enough in here that he'll not only find Jesus, he'll be able to be a preacher and be able to take the gospel to the rest of his tribes and the entire nation that he lives in. There's enough in here. We don't need people. If we just dig into this, what we need is here. It's here. So... Let's look at, let's compare a couple of things real quick. So what I want to do, um, Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, he says, When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and we went into Daniel chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and we covered what the abomination of desolation was. Little horn with a big mouth, world leader, final king, remember that? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and in the holy place, what is the abomination of desolation? Someone tell me. Some sort of... An image? An image, yeah. Some sort of what? Speaking, like talking it, images. It could talk, it could yeah. speak, right. The beast has the ability to make this, in, this entity, whatever this is, whether it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional, we don't know, but it has the ability to make it speak. It could be a flat panel display, it could be a wood carving, we don't know what it is, but we do know this. Whatever it is, it represents the man of sin, the beast man. It is his image that's placed in the holy place in Jerusalem, right? So Jesus says, when you see this, let him which is in Judea flee to the mountain, him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out, and neither him which is in the field return back to take in his clothing even. So there, you have to have a plan. It's got to be ready. You've got to execute it right when you see it. We talked about how we're the first generation that could ever see this happen. Not before 1953 would you ever be able to be any place in the world to see something. And certainly now, with 6.75 billion smartphones around the world, if you don't have one in your hand, you'll be standing next to somebody that does. Statistically, the chances are pretty good you're going to be in the vicinity of someone that's got it that can say, hey, look, they can see it and they can turn it around, now you can see it. So that 6.75 billion just now covered probably 9 billion individuals, right? So even in the midst of Africa, in the middle of the heart of the Central African Republic, everybody's got cell phones. But look at what it says over here in Luke. So turn over to Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> because in Luke 17, Luke covers the same thing we're covering in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. In Luke 17, Luke covers it, but in a little bit different order. So... You see in Luke 17, 24, we're going to go through, we're going to read 24 through 36. So catch the order that Luke puts it, and then we're going to focus on one piece. For as the lightning that lights the heaven, or the, sorry, pardon me, let me get my Bible up here so I can read, get my bifocus focused here. For as the lightning that lightens one part of heaven shines even to the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah. Okay, here we go. We talked about the days of Noah last time, remember? We spent some amount of time talking about the days of Noah. And uh, we also talked about uh, Judas being called the son of perdition, right? I've got an update on that. All sorts of fun little. We're going to just jump like little rabbits all over the place tonight. So. It was as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. So we had the conversation in Matthew, when Matthew, in Matthew, when it was reading it, Matthew says, uh, But as the days of Noah were, verse 37 of Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not till the flood came and took them away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. 
And we talked about who was taken away, who was destroyed, and who was left behind, right? And we came to the conclusion from Matthew's gospel that the people that were the non-Noah people were the ones that were taken away and destroyed. And in Luke here, he specifically says it. He says, likewise, as it was, oh, sorry, uh, verse 27 of, of Luke 17, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage till the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Well, who was destroyed? The people that were not in the ark because the people that were in the ark were the ones that were saved. So Luke's rendition of Jesus' teaching actually declares that it was the wicked that were destroyed. Now keep in mind, <clears throat> uh, Luke comes along almost 50 years later, 40 years later, after Jesus. So Jesus was around, he dies 30 AD, and here's Luke 65 to 70 AD writing this gospel. So he's interviewing people, pulling stories together, getting the historical accounts firsthand from people. Luke wasn't there to see Jesus I mean, if he did, we don't have any reference to it that I know of. Um, but Luke ended up going around and doing a research project to put his gospel together. Matthew was one of the guys that was there. He was in the, he was in the throes of it. So we leave, we leave room for Luke as he's gathering the data. He's gathering what people heard. He's gathering what Jesus said from people who were there, right? And he's putting all those pieces together. It's interesting to me that Luke somehow in his conversations as he was doing his research and writing his gospel gets that thing that says that that the flood came and destroyed them all and he's very plain and very clear about it and then he goes right into lot which we don't have this in matthew verse 28 likewise also as it was in the days of lot they did eat they drank they bought they sold they planted they built but the same day that lot went out of sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all who was destroyed? It wasn't Lot and his, and his daughters. It was the people that were left behind. Yeah. <laughs> that is a, that's a 19th, was that in the movie, that song? Was it? No. In, oh, okay. <laughs> even thus shall it be in the day, when, now here it says, Luke says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... He, which will be on the housetop with his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that's in the field, let him not likewise return back. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back and she turned in, she lost her life. She was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back. So Luke in his gospel is recording, you don't even have time to look back. You need to have your plan in place. You need to be prepared. Remember, there's the P word. You've got to be prepared. You've got to execute your plan. When it happens, it's got to be there, got to be ready. You've got to do it. There is no time to wait. Remember Lot's wife. And then he says this, whoever will seek to save his life will lose it. And whoever shall lose his life will preserve it. So the people who try to save their life when the abomination of desolation is revealed will be the ones that lose their lives. I tell you in that night, there will be, here we go. Here's the one taken and one left. I tell you in that night, there shall be two men in one bed, one taken and the other left, two women grinding together, the one taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one taken and the other left. Now, the one thing that I want to point out here is Jesus' word in verse 30. He says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Even thus shall it be when the, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... Those who are on the housetop, let them not come down. Now, what Matthew said when Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Let them which would be on Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down. Luke says, Thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Matthew says, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Now think about that for a minute. Matthew says when the abomination of desolation is in the holy place that those things will happen. Luke says when the Son of Man is revealed those things will happen. So we have a little bit of, a, we have a little bit of an issue we have to figure out. Is the Son of Man the abomination of desolation because they're both revealed on the same day? No. What else could it be? I beg your pardon? Layering. Layering. Help me understand. Happening at the same time. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. 
So here's what I'm here's what I'm thinking. This is what I'm perceiving as I read this, that the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place is going to be the cataclysmic effort or the event that actually shows who Jesus really is. Before Jesus appears in the clouds, Jesus is, I mean, look at this. We're back here. 2,000 years ago, Jesus is saying, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place where it should not be, here's what you need to do. And Jesus is laying out a chronology. Boom, 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 boom. Not only is he saying it's going to happen, he's saying what's going to happen after that. He's laying it out. This is one of the ways I believe that Israel will identify that Jesus really is Messiah. There will be people who will believe when the abomination appears because they're going to see that Jesus said it. They're going to see that, they, that the things happen the way, Jesus, the way that Jesus spoke it. And Israel, who has never believed that Jesus was even a prophet, will now be forced to look at this and say, wow, if he could say that 2,000 years ago, we probably need to reevaluate who this man really is. And I think what's going to happen is there are going to be people in Israel, not everybody, but I think that Jesus will indeed be revealed when that happens. And the people will get a chance to see him for who he actually is. And there'll be people who will come to faith because of it. So would you say that's when Zechariah has been able to look upon him when he appears at that point? Oh, I, that's a good question. I don't know if it's then or if I kind of always have thought the Zechariah scripture about them looking on him whom they pierce is when he actually returns. Okay. I've, I've, and it doesn't mean that I'm right, but I've always assumed that was like around Revelation 19. Okay. Yeah, that's a really great question, though. So back to Matthew 24, we have, we have this, this uh, account then of people being killed and where the eagles are, where the body is, there the eagles will gather, right? We've talked about that. We spent some time talking about that. And then verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from the heavens, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with the, with the sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. So I'm covering that before we jump back to Matthew 25, because in Matthew 25, we're going to be talking about the appearing of the Lord too. We talk about the appearing of the Lord here in Matthew 24, and we're going to reach, we're going to talk in just a minute about the appearing of the Lord in Matthew 25, because it's covered twice. So fast forward here, just in bullet points, in Matthew 24, 36, it says of the day, that day and hour, nobody knows not the angels of heaven, and the book of Luke actually says not even the Son of Man knows. In other words, nobody, including Jesus, even knows the day or the hour that he's coming back. Jesus standing, he is standing at the starting block waiting for the, for the gun to fire off so that he can take off and come back. Just waiting. And there's not anything that he can do about it because he's not the one that determines when. So the interesting part about this is the scripture says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that all things are placed under Jesus' authority, that he is the head. 1 Corinthians 15, did I get that right? I might have that chapter wrong. I might need to go back and look at that one. But Scripture says that he's not only the head, Colossians says he's the head, but that he is the head and that God's placed all things under his control, but that God himself is not under Jesus' control. But that right now, Jesus is over everything, but Jesus, even in his position right now, still does not know when he's coming back. That's the one thing that God has reserved for himself. The one thing. Everything else God's placed underneath, underneath of Jesus, underneath of his control and his dominion. <clears throat> so, of the hour no one knows, the coming of the Son of Man will happen. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other one left. Right? As it was in the days of Noah, who was taken in the days of Noah? The wicked. According to Luke, who was taken in the days of Lot? The wicked. As it was in the days of the Son of Man, so will it be in the days of the coming of, or so shall it, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field, one taken on the other left. Two women will be grinding, one will be taken on the other one left. Watch therefore for you know what hour the Lord comes. The, I believe that it, as it's speaking, the wicked are the ones that are taken in Matthew, and I think it's the wicked are the ones that are taken in Luke. Because the wicked were the ones that were taken in both Lot and in Noah. So when we look at this, 
we're going to start to see as we this is the beginning of wicked this is the beginning of the idea of of the elect and the not elect it's the beginning of the separation between people whose deeds bear them out and and people whose deeds do not bear them out when we look at the faithful and unfaithful servants in verse 45 of matthew 24 who is the faithful and wise servant whom his lord has made ruler over his house to give meat in due season Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he returns, finds him so doing. <clears throat> in other words, a servant of the master is given a task to feed, his, to feed the family, to feed the master's family, to feed the servants of the master. When the master comes back, if he finds the servant doing it, thumbs up. He gets rewarded. When the master comes back and finds the same servant not doing it, thumbs down. Scripture says that there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and that the person is cast into outer darkness. And then Jesus runs to the next. He goes right to the next one. He's like, okay, ten virgins. Let's talk about the ten virgins, right? Ten virgins. And the watchman, we had the watchman prior to that too, the same thing. The watchman, had he been watching his house, wouldn't have allowed it to be broken in. The watchman that's the wise watchman is astute, alert, paying attention, awake, watching for the thief. The watchman that's the bad watchman doesn't. The good watchman is rewarded. The bad watchman is not rewarded. He's punished. You get to the ten virgins. We have ten virgins. They're all elect. All ten start with the exact same position. They're all virgins. You can't be kind of a virgin. Right? It's pretty absolute. You either are a virgin or you are not a virgin. There is no in-between ground. So everybody starts with this absolute position. They are indeed a virgin, which means they're living a pure life. They have been trusted with the master. They are responsible for preparing the bridal chamber for the master. And then they're responsible to wait for the master to show up. The only difference, they all even slumbered and slept. They all got tired and they fell asleep. No difference so far between any of them. The only difference between the five that were wise and the five that were foolish were that they were prepared. The five wise ones were prepared. They brought extra oil in case they needed it. That was the difference for them because when the difficult time came, meaning that they had to have oil in their vessels and they didn't have it, they're out now scavenging, trying to get oil at midnight. And the wise ones were prepared and they went into the, they went into the wedding with the master. That was it. It was all about being prepared. The ones who weren't prepared spent time trying to get prepared before it was too late, and there was no time to do it. They couldn't pull it off. And because they weren't prepared, they were not allowed into the wedding, and not only that, the master answered the door and said, I don't even know who you are. So did the master know who the, who the, ten virgin, who the five foolish virgins were prior to that? We don't know. There's nothing that says whether he did or didn't, right? All we have is tradition to tell us that, so we kind of have to park that on the side bench. But we do know this, that the fact that they, the fact that they did not, that they were not prepared, meant that they didn't get to know the master, right? They didn't get to go in. They didn't get to meet him. Whatever the case may be, they ended up paying the penalty of their unpreparedness and their foolishness by sacrificing their place. Scripture says, out there is outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? So then we get to the talents. <clears throat> we get to the talents and we've got three guys. We've got one guy that, have we, did we read this one last week? I think we did, didn't we? Did we not? Okay, let's start there then, because we did the 10 virgins. Right, yeah. Right All right. So let's talk about the talents. Here we go. So we're going to pick up. Last week we left off here then. So Matthew 25, 14, we've got caught up. Now we're back where we started. Let's go. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country who calls his own servants and delivers to them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Every man according to his several ability. And straightway he takes his journey. So here's what this is saying so far. The master is taking off, going on a journey. He's got three guys he's going to trust. He's worked with these three guys before. So Jesus here says, each one according to his several ability. That means that he knows the ability of each individual man. And he looks at Ephraim and he says, I've worked with you before. You've managed my store. You've done a good job. I can trust you. I'm going to give you five bucks. 
right? And he goes to Kevin, he says, Kevin, you know what? I've watched you work. You're not half bad. You're okay. You know, I'll give you a chance to prove yourself a little bit more. So here's $2. Go and invest it. Do something good with it, right? And then Aaron here, she gets a buck. Because the master says, you know, I've been watching you. There's potential. It's just buried. We just need to see if we can coalesce this or coerce this out of you. So I'm going to give you a dollar. I'm going to give you the chance to show me that you can be faithful with something that's small. And he leaves. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made five more. And likewise, he that had received the two talents also gained two more. But the one that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So here we have three people, two of whom took this seriously and began investing. The one person who chose not to. Now, we don't know why yet because Jesus hasn't told us, but we're going to find out in just a minute. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought five more, saying, Lord, you gave me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside these five talents more. And his Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So here we go. The, the, the first guy that had the five really gave it his all, doubled the master's money. When the master came back, he was pumped. And he's like, here it is. I made you five more. And he got rewarded for it. And now he's stepping into more responsibility, more authority, and more management. He also that had received two talents, verse 22, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Behold, I've gained you two more beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What question is Jesus answering in this parable? What question is Jesus answering? We have the answer to this. Matthew 24, 4. What's, when will these things be? What's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the age? Remember, Jesus is answering those three questions. So how does this apply? To when will these things be? What's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the age? Jesus is giving them these parables, answering their question. What's the last thing he says? Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know that you're a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strewed. I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there you have what is yours. And so he hands him his buck back, gives him his dollar. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. There you go. You now have what's yours. His Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I sowed not, and I gathered where I have not strewed. You ought to therefore have put my money with the exchangers, so that at my coming I could have received my own with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to the one that has ten. For to every one that has will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him that has not will be taken away even that which he has. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I knew that you gathered where you'd not strewn. I knew that you harvested where you hadn't. I feared you. And so I've hid what was yours. Here you go. I'm giving it back to you. So the first two guys knew their master differently than the third guy did. Scripture does not say that the first two guys were not afraid of their master. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they were. It doesn't say they weren't. So we don't know. We just have to leave that on the side. Was he a man that, that was feared by his servants? Maybe. There was one that feared him for sure, right? If the one servant knew that he reaped where he hadn't sown, that he ended up that he was a type of that he was a certain type of business person it's likely that the other two servants had observed the same thing but interestingly whatever the first two perceptions were 
it was enough to motivate them. They were determined because something that they evidently knew that the last guy didn't was, if I show the master, he's going to reward me. I've got to put something into this. I've got to show the master. And so they gave it something, right? And the master really even underscores this with the guy that had the one. Because he said, you knew these things about me. You should have taken a reasonable risk. You could have at least given my money to the banker and he could have earned interest while I was gone and you could have given me back a dollar and 16 cents. And what the master is saying by that is if you'd have at least even done that, I would have respected your effort. So, so Jesus is using this guy as an example and he's saying, look, you need to know your master. You need to know what your master expects. You need to give it your all. And if you're scared, that's not an excuse. Find a reasonable amount of risk that you can push yourself in and take some risk, something. Even if your risk is minimal, you know, the chance of you, the chance of that guy losing his money with a banker would have been very, very slim. Would have been very slim. But it could have happened, right? The guy that he gave it to could have lost it and he could have come back to the master and said, Master, I was afraid of you. I thought you were going to whoop me. And so I gave, your, I gave your dollar bill to the banker so that I could earn interest, but the bank even lost it. I think even in that case, I think the master would have said, good job for trying. I really do, based on what I'm reading in scripture. Because it seems to me that what we're seeing is that the effort is what mattered. Knowing the master, knowing his heart, and actually investing and taking a risk. Now, how does that fit into what Jesus said? What's the sign of, what, when is the end of the age and the sign of your coming? Jesus is telling us, the most important thing about my return is that you know me and that you take a risk and you invest what I'm giving you. Do not bury it. Do not leave it laid down. You need to do something with it because when I come back, and we have our conversation, I'm going to be expecting you to put effort into it. And if you don't, just what happened to this guy with the dollar bill is what's going to happen to you. This is not Jesus with, funny, but with, with fluffy bunny slippers. This is the warring Jesus. This is the king Jesus. The first time that Jesus came, he came as a sacrifice. When he comes back, he's not sacrificing himself again. He's done with that. He's already sacrificed himself. He doesn't have to do it twice. When he comes back this time, he's going to be the global ruler. And we right here, all of us in this room, everybody online, we are all being watched. All of our decisions, the things that we decide, what we do with our money, all of it is being watched. And we will be held accountable because he has a kingdom to run and he's watching for people to put in positions of authority. I am convinced that this Christian life is a preparation for us to be ready for the millennial kingdom. When Jesus comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years, I want the Swiss, Alps. I, I want some place. I want a country. I don't want some, I, I don't want to manage the porta potty on 15th and Kelly. That's not what I want. What I want is something. I'll take a continent. I'll take a country. If I can't have that, I'll take a city of at least a million, right? But I want something that's going to take some challenge. I want Jesus to look at me and say, you know what, Buck? You really did a good job. I mean, you made an income. You invested it. You did the things you were supposed to. You took risk. You propelled the gospel. I can trust you. I, you've shown me in your life that I can trust you. Here, take Mexico. I'm like, está bien. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> right? I'll finally get the chance to have a Mexican church. That's what I want. I want. That's what I want from the Lord. And that's the attitude we have to have because that's the attitude that Jesus says the master rewards. It's the ones who know him, who know his heart, know the way he do, they know the way he does business. They're willing to take risk. They're willing to invest their, their gains. They're willing to gain for the Lord and give it back to him. Those are the things that he's watching for. Jesus said, what I'm telling you right here is more important than you knowing when the end of the world is because your end will happen whether it's the end or not. Amen. Right? Yeah. Every one of us is going to have an end. 
whether it's today, tomorrow, or the next day, either we're going to go see Jesus or he's going to come and see us. One way or the other, it's going to happen. And Jesus is saying, don't get fixated on when the end is because your end may be before the end. Right? Let's keep going. <clears throat> Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Before I go to the rest of it, let me tell you this. I spent some time this week focusing on cutting asunder and outer darkness because I was curious to see if I could find what I could find in Scripture about that. Interestingly, this is fascinating, what I learned this week was being cast into outer darkness only appears three times in Scripture. They're all in Matthew. Outer darkness appears three times. Now, from a systemic standpoint, from an analytical standpoint, that's not enough data, right? If I'm teaching, if I'm teaching research methods, and I teach research methods, that's one of the things that I teach for a master's course. If I'm teaching research methods, if someone were to come to me and say, I have three samples, I would say, that'll tell you about the three samples. It's not going to give you enough data about a population, though. To be able to manage a population, you've got to have a lot more than three. If the population's five, you could probably pull it off, right? That's why it's always sketchy when you see something in the newspaper that says 72% of Americans think that President Biden is doing an excellent job, right? You want to look. I'm not saying he is or isn't. I'm saying that when you see something like that, it doesn't matter what it is. Or it could be something, pick on Trump for a minute. President, you know, ex-President Trump is responsible for the, for the train derailment in Ohio, right? Okay, where do we get these things at? Well, there was a, there was a, a survey that was done or whatever. Look and see what that survey is. Like a 72%, 72% of Americans believe that so-and-so is doing a great job. Look and see what the data for that is. If You're likely going to see this. This data taken from a sample of 1,200 people that were randomly called on the phone in the state of New York. Well, 1,200 people from New York State hardly represent 360 million people in the United States. Much less the people that, are having, that have phones that are willing to answer phones and that are willing to even answer a question about some political topic. How many of you hang up on people when they call and say, do you have a minute to talk about something political? And you hang up and say, I'm sorry, I don't got time. So now what you got are recluse individuals that don't have a life that are now, that are now establishing statistics. Right? Yeah. I'm being honest. To be able to identify a population, to be able to quantify 360 million people with any, with any believability whatsoever, you probably have to have at least 240 million responses to be able to identify what the 360 million generally believe. That's probably even within a 15 to 20 percent margin of error, I would be willing to bet. So there, it's one of those things where we don't, with the data that we're being given, right, you just have to be very skeptical and look and see what it, where it was gathered, how it was gathered, who it was gathered by. I say all that to say this. We have three scriptures, three scriptures. That's, that used the term outer darkness. That's not enough for us to be able to really create a doctrine. But I have a thought that I want to bounce off of you, and you can take this and weigh it out, and this is Buck. So I'm not saying Scripture necessarily supports this, but I think it could support this. If you look at outer darkness, the only way you can have outer darkness is if you have inner light, right? You can't have outer, because outer suggests a perimeter, so using basic logic skills, we can say that there must be a perimeter, right? A perimeter where outside of that perimeter it's dark, but inside the perimeter it's not. Now it might be less dark just on the inside of the perimeter, but the idea here is that there is some kind of a square, circle, whatever, there's a line and outside of that, it is dark, which means that somewhere inside of it, it's not. So I got thinking about this, and I thought, when we look at the New Jerusalem, when we look at the New Jerusalem, Jesus, the Scripture says, and we'll read this in the Revelation, Scripture says that Jesus and the Father are the light of the New Jerusalem. They are the light of it. It says that there's no need for the sun or the moon there, because Jesus is the light of it. And those that live there will walk in the light of it. It's actually the, re it's actually the definition of the day of the Lord. Because the Old Testament prophet says 
that when the Lord comes to his place, he will establish a light that is neither light nor dark, but that is still considered light that does not end. And because it has no ending, it has no evening. And because it has no ending, it's perpetual day. It is therefore the day of the Lord. <clears throat> it is the one day that exists. Jesus begins the day of the Lord and it continues infinitely because he is the light of it and it never stops. That's what the day of the Lord is. It's not a 24-hour period when something happens. It is a new type of day that's never existed before where Jesus is the light of it and the light begins and never stops. It is his day. It is the day that he is owner of. It is the day of the Lord. So when we see this, what we see is that Jesus is the light of the New Jerusalem. So I'm wondering if the outer darkness is people who aren't allowed into the New Jerusalem. You're cast in, it goes along with what Jesus is saying because what we have here is this idea that they're thrust out of the kingdom and they're not allowed near the king. In all of these circumstances, they're cast away from the leader. They're cast away from the, from the bridegroom. They're cast away from the master. And it says, cast this wicked one into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here, you, if you continue down this vein of thought, you have people who are cast outside of the New Jerusalem who are not allowed in. They never get to see Jesus. They never get to see God. They live in eternity outside without the ability to do anything about it. There is weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're constantly reminded that because they did not live their life according to the gospel, they did not live their life investing it the way the master expected it, they're never able to see Jesus face to face. They're never, never able to meet God. Or after their judgment, that's it, right? So I'm throwing that out to you just for your consideration. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just telling you that by the time I was done thinking this through, that's kind of where I landed. Yes, sir? Outer darkness, either hell or separation from God. Metaphorically, how did it happen with the wedding day? They were not allowed in the wedding in, into the feast. That's right. Right. So metaphorically, is with the wedding banquet not being allowed again, but is that outer darkness actually hell or separation from God? Yeah. And both of them are those synonyms. Yeah, I, I don't think it's hell. One of the reasons I don't think it's hell is because hell is destroyed. So in the end, death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire and they're gone. So when we're all said and finished, again, spoiler, we'll get to this at the end of the Revelation, right? These things all tie together, though, and that's one of the reasons why we're going to start, we're gonna, you're going to see this more and more. These things start weaving in. We're going to start telling things that are coming up because they apply now. When everything is said and done, there are two things, two places that exist, and that's it. There's the lake of fire and there's the earth, period. That's it. And we live with God as man and God together on the planet Earth, or those whose names are not written in the lake of, in the Lamb's Book of Life are cast into the lake of fire. Those are the only two places that exist. There is no place else. So I love what, I love that Kevin brought this up, and thank you for doing that, because in our mind we have these kind of we have kind of Dante's Inferno mindset, right? There are layers. To hell there's you know that there's the not so bad hell there's the kind of bad hell and then there's the really bad hell right but ultimately when everything's all said and done all of these places are consumed by the lake of fire they're cast into the lake of fire and they ultimately all are all destroyed in the lake of fire and we only have these two things the lake of fire and the earth and that's it so if outer darkness is the lake of fire could it be i suppose possibly it doesn't seem to fit, but that doesn't mean I'm right. I mean, I don't have enough scripture to be able to say yes or no, right? So anyway, something to think about, something to chew about. If you guys ever run into scripture that you think informs that, bring it back. Shoot me an email, shoot me a text, let me know, because uh, I'd be curious. But it's interesting, Matthew's the only one that uses the outer darkness. The weeping and gnashing of teeth in outer darkness. Yeah. Could that be linked to like in um, Corinthians, I think, where he talks about like someone would get into like, the earth, heaven, but like just themselves and themselves. Oh, I love it. So yeah, so what so what she's saying is could it be in Corinth there's a scripture in Corinthians that talks about could it that it talks about judgment and it says they themselves will be saved, although and one translation says, although with the smell of smoke on their clothing. And it's talking about uh, how everything is burned away, the wood, hay, and stubble are burned away, but gold, silver, and precious jewels remain. So um, I think it could be, honestly. 
I think it could be. I also think, though, that it's more dependent on how a person's life was invested, not necessarily just on the fact that they don't have a reward. Here's the reason why I say that. When Jesus was crucified, the man on his right was told, you'll be with me today in paradise. Mm -hmm. He had no opportunity to raise, to, to have fruit in his life. Mm -hmm. The only fruit that that man could have had in his life was faith in Jesus because he died before Jesus did, right? Uh, well, I say that. No, strike that and rewind. It was the other way around. Jesus actually died before they did because they had to break the guy's legs. So he died after Jesus. But, <clears throat> but the only opportunity he would have had to produce fruit would have been while he was hanging on the cross next to Jesus. So I think he probably entered into eternity with not much, mm -hmm. if anything, right? But, but Jesus says, you'll be with me today in paradise. So it makes me think that there's more to it than just the timing of it, that there's the investment of our lives. It, whatever time we have, the Lord expects from us, however much time we have, he expects that to be invested. Mm -hmm. Right? Can I ask you one more thing? Yeah. And, yep. Aren't there three layers of darkness in the Bible? If I recall, shame and desolation, enemy oppression, and then hopelessness. Um, if I recall correctly, aren't all three of those in the scripture? Yeah, I don't know that they're called layers, though. I don't know that, I'm not aware of anything that's that layered. Yeah. I don't think they're even called darkness. It's, um, yeah. I think I, the but, you dark. know what? Find it and then bring it back. And, and let's talk about it, because I'd love to see it. Yeah. No, no, no. That's good. So, okay, let's get back on track here. Thank you. Anybody online? You guys are hearing us. Did you, were you able to hear all the questions and answers and responses and everything? Okay. Um, all right. So let's go to, uh, so here is the final of Matthew 25, sheep and the goats. This is where the rubber hits the road. So for those of you that were part of the Jesus movement, in honor of the movie, uh, <laughs> You, uh, you probably remember a song called The Sheep and the Goats. Keith Green. By Keith. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember that? Anybody? Keith Green's song, The Sheep and the Goats? Okay. I will put it on when we're on break. I will play The Sheep and the Goats, and you guys can listen to it. Uh, it's a spectacular song, and... Uh, Every time I hear it, it makes me cry. So here we go. Verse 31 of chapter 25. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne in his glory. And before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides sheep from goats. Verse 33. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. So did we talk about, I don't think we did. Did we talk about the right hand? Not yet. We will. So it's gonna, you're going to see this more than once because in the Revelation, you're going to see that, uh, that the right hand is used in the Revelation as well. So let's discuss real quickly what the right hand stands for. The right hand was the hand of favor. So in Scripture, uh, the right hand was... The hand of friendship, of fellowship, of authority, of power, of structure, the right hand. The left hand was considered the unclean hand. So, you know, you would, you would bless somebody with your right hand. You would wipe your backside with your left hand. So it's one of those things where when we, when we see, like Queen Esther, when she, when she, when she was approaching King Xerxes, he had to stretch out his scepter, right? He would have likely taken his right hand with his scepter and stretched it out because that was his hand of authority. The scepter, the extension of his authority, she would have walked up and touched the censer and that would have been her pardon. Had the king not extended that to her, the guards would have come and carried her away and beheaded her because it was unlawful to enter the king's presence without being summoned, even for a wife. It's a good thing she was loved, right? Otherwise, we might not have the chapter in the scripture that we got. So when she called the ladies to fast with her, the reason they were fasting was because they were fasting for the king's favor. She knew that if she walked in unannounced to pray for, or to ask the king for the defense of the Jewish people, and he did not extend his censor to her, she would be beheaded. And she knew that. That's why they prayed and fasted before she went. So the right hand, you're going to see through Scripture all the way through, 
You're going to see the right hand of favor. You're going to see the right hand, this, the right hand. He reached down and touched me with his right hand. That was the hand of favor. You'll see that all the way through. So let's keep going here. So he'll set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Then shall he say, then shall he also say to them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. I was naked, you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked, sick, in prison, and did not minister to you? Then shall he answer them and say, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Jesus is answering a question. When will these things be? What's the sign of your coming and what's the end of the age? Jesus finally gets to the end of the age, yeah. doesn't he? Finally gets there. And what's Jesus' topic? Does Jesus answer the question, when will be the end of the age? No, he doesn't. Jesus answers the question, what will happen to you at the end of the age? All the way through this, Jesus' response has been, you, 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 you. And I say that editorially, me, 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 right? It's us, 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 us. Jesus is saying, people, you're what's important. When I come back and when the end of the world is are going to happen. They're going to happen. You can be guaranteed they're going to happen. But the big question is, what's going to happen to you? Are you prepared? 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 Every time Jesus keeps coming back and saying, are you prepared? Are you invested? Are you bought in? Are you ready? Are you watching? Are you alert? Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Over and over and over again. That's Jesus' response to the question. When will these things be? What's the sign of your coming? And when's the end of the age? I think it's interesting that Jesus spends two chapters, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, two out of 28, focused just on helping us see what we need to be doing so that when we end our life, however it may end, whether it's at the Lord's coming or our own death, that we're not embarrassed when we stand in front of him. Right? That's his answer. So having said that, let's take a little break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about something. That we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the word meat and why it's important. We're also going to talk about the difference between Matthew and Matthew, because in one place it says this. Let me find it. Give me a second. Um, Matthew 24, 30 says this. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven from one end to the other. So that's what it says in Matthew 24. Matthew 25 says this, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, 
Then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So we actually have two different experiences. We have the sign of the sun, and we have the appearing of the sun, the coming of the sun. So we have the sign of the Son of Man, and then we have the coming of the Son of Man. And they're two different things, and maybe you've never seen it in Scripture. Until just a couple of years ago, I hadn't. So we'll talk about that in real detail. So we're going to talk about the difference between the sign of the Son of Man and the coming of the Son of Man, and we're also going to talk about the word to meet, the word of fantasies. So let's take a little break, and then let's come back, and we'll keep going. Anybody online have questions or thoughts before we, before we take a break? No? All right, we're going to take a seven to ten minute break and let's come back and we'll keep going. I have a question. All right, what's that? Are we discussing M E A T or M E E T? Ah, it's M E E T. Meat. M E E T. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back.